Adolf Hitler's ascent to power, unveiling the complexities behind Germany's history. As we traverse the annals of history, few episodes resonate as profoundly as the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party within the intricate framework of 1930s Germany. A saga etched with the resurgence of far-right political factions, echoing apprehensions that continue to reverberate through the corridors of time. The cautionary tales of extremist groups attaining power whether by the people's choice or usurpation, cast a haunting shadow upon the landscape of political discourse. Among these narratives, the ascent of Adolf Hitler stands as a pivotal example, signaling a chapter in history fraught with implications that echo into the contemporary era. Echoes of this historical passage reverberated in the words of prominent figures. Bernie Sanders invoked the specter of Nazism in discourse with the Christian Science Monitor in 2015, while Hillary Clinton echoed these sentiments on The View in 2023, emphasizing Hitler's lawful election in 1932. Yet the narrative depicting the Nazis' acquisition of power solely through the German electorate oversimplifies the labyrinthine history of fascism. It propagates the notion of a surge in middle and working class resentments propelling Hitler and his cohorts into the echelons of power. However, this portrayal, while not devoid of merit, eclipses the nuanced intricacies of German politics in the 1930s, the structural dynamics within the Weimar Republic, the shrewd stratagem employed by the Nazis, and the revelations gleaned from surviving records. The complete narrative paints less of a despot, buoyed by disgruntled voters, and more of a calculated manipulation of political avenues and media channels, often intertwined with the specter of violence. A deeper exploration is warranted to unravel the true tapestry of Adolf Hitler's journey to power. The genesis of Hitler's hegemony within the Nazi party predates his assumption of the chancellorship by over a decade. The National Socialist German Workers' Party of Weimar, Germany, harbored long-standing aspirations for tangible authority. Its inception as the German Workers' Party in 1919 swiftly metamorphosed into the more infamous nomenclature within a year. Adolf Hitler, a formidable presence within the party almost from its inception, emerged as an indispensable asset, owing to his captivating oratory prowess, theatrical rallies, and a 25-point program, vehemently repudiating the Treaty of Versailles, while fervently intertwining nationalism with anti-Semitism. Notably, the Weiner Holocaust Library underscores party leaders' perception of Hitler's pivotal role in the party's viability, culminating in their acquiescence to his demand for absolute control, even after a brief resignation. By 1921, he had assumed the dictatorial helm of the Nazi party. During Hitler's tenure, the Nazis fortified their paramilitary wing, the Sturmabteilung, SA, epitomized by the ill-fated Beer Hall Putsch of 1923. Despite its swift suppression, legal maneuvering shielded Hitler from facing the Supreme Court, and his five-year sentence for treason was promptly suspended. Upon his release, Hitler diligently expanded party membership and reoriented efforts towards seizing power through the existing system rather than instigating an overt revolution. Throughout the 1920s, the Nazis expanded their grassroots support, amassing 180,000 registered members by the decade's denouement. Hitler, through publications and public addresses, meticulously refined the party's ideological manifesto. Innovations in organizational strategies facilitated the Nazis' infiltration across diverse professional spheres, consolidating their political support base. 
the Weimar Republic, ensconcing an unstable parliamentary system, grappled with multifaceted challenges. Its constitutional genesis, precipitated at the conclusion of World War I and championed by moderate Social Democratic Party leader Friedrich Ebert, birthed a parliamentary framework, endowed with extensive powers vested in the Reichstag, universal suffrage for individuals over 20, and proportional representation for political entities. However, the Republic found itself falling short of radicalism, facing discontent from extreme socialist and communist factions, alongside discord within the economic stratum averse to democratic inclinations. Revolts emanating from both leftist and rightist fringes beset the Republic from its inception. The early 1920s bore witness to hyperinflation, the most severe in post-war Europe, while the government's acquiescence to the Treaty of Versailles drew widespread public ire. Although acknowledging the treaty stood as the least unfavorable option post-World War I, its punitive clauses severely enfeebled Germany, exacerbating the economic turmoil. The far right fervently weaponized the treaty as a rallying cry against the government, a sentiment enthusiastically exploited by the Nazis. As reported by the BBC and other sources, the Weimar Republic's reliance on proportional representation further exacerbated its vulnerabilities, precluding the emergence of a stable majority. This framework facilitated the ascent of smaller parties, such as the Nazis, into the Reichstag. The onset of the Great Depression, coupled with the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, served as a catalyst in bolstering Nazi popularity. The Wall Street Crash of 1929 inflicted severe wounds on Germany, heavily reliant on American investments. Escalating unemployment and burgeoning poverty reignited societal unrest, affording Adolf Hitler and the Nazis a strategic opportunity. Their electoral support burgeoned, surpassing 18% in the 1930 elections and nearing 38% in 1932 securing a formidable 230 seats in the Reichstag. Analysis of the 1932 election, per The Atlantic, delineated Hitler's electoral stronghold, primarily emanating from rural, historically Protestant domains. The Nazis augmented their support by undermining rival parties, inflating rally attendance by busing in additional supporters, and capitalizing on apprehensions regarding communism. The specter of the Russian Revolution continued to evoke anxiety across Europe, particularly resonating with the conservative upper-class echelons in Germany, who perceived in Hitler and the Nazis a bulwark against domestic upheavals, while the upper stratum predominantly aligned with the Nazis, a segment across various voter spectra gravitated toward the party. Traditional left, right, and centrist factions grappled with articulating a cohesive alternative, ensnared in gridlock despite collectively outnumbering the Nazis. Despite the SA's extensively documented violence, the German press refrained from portraying Hitler and the Nazis as a formidable threat. Weimar newspapers cast the party and its leader as assertive, well-intentioned provocateurs rather than terrorists. Newspapers across the political spectrum extended tepid commendation for Nazism's professed objectives of uplifting Germany, occasionally reproaching their methodologies. This lenient portrayal shielded much of the SA's violence from public scrutiny or distorted its veracity. Ironically, while newspapers echoed the Nazi narrative concerning the perils of communism, Germany's Communist Party, the Kommunistische Partei, KPD, had begun moderating its stance by 1932. Nevertheless, the die had been cast. Traditional conservative factions, initially adversarial to Nazism, commenced collaborative endeavors with its adherents, either dismissing or feigning ignorance of their violent methodologies, akin to the media's approach. 
Hitler's ascent to the chancellorship was facilitated through the invocation of presidential powers. Following the 1932 elections, where the Nazi party emerged as the largest bloc in the Reichstag, but fell short of a majority, a snap election later that year exacerbated the impasse in forming a functional coalition. Chancellor Heinrich Brüning turned to Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution, bestowing extensive powers upon the German president to act in emergencies sans parliamentary consensus. This provision enabled Brüning, in concert with President Paul von Hindenburg, to implement policies despite vehement opposition from both Nazis and Communists. By 1932, Brüning's position had become untenable. His successor, Franz von Papen, grappled with unpopularity. Despite Papen's shortcomings and the electoral gains of the Nazis, Hindenburg resisted appointing Adolf Hitler as Chancellor. Papen and the President's advisors pursued an alternative coalition, encompassing the Nazis as a minor, manageable partner. Undeterred by the electoral setback in the 1932 presidential race against Hindenburg, Hitler persevered, demanding nothing less than the chancellorship. Even subsequent to the electoral losses endured by the Nazis in 1932, the formation of a stable government sans their participation became an insurmountable challenge. In January 1933, Hindenburg appointed Hitler as chancellor. Subsequently, the conflagration at the Reichstag facilitated Hitler's endeavor to sway Hindenburg into suspending civil liberties, paving the insidious path toward the systematic dismantling of German democracy. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. The enigma surrounding Cleopatra's lineage has ignited an ongoing debate among scholars, delving into the depths of history to unravel her true ethnicity. Was Cleopatra of Greek descent, as suggested by her Ptolemaic roots, or did her heritage embrace African origins, shrouded in ancient artwork and newfound archaeological discoveries? Scholars advocating Cleopatra's Hellenistic heritage draw from her upbringing in the cultural folds of Greece. Educated and immersed in Greek traditions, she exuded a profound connection to her Greek lineage, sparking arguments in favor of her Caucasian roots. However, an opposing faction sheds light on depictions in ancient art portraying Cleopatra with distinct African features. These representations, portraying her with darker skin, fuller lips, and broader features, raise questions about her lineage and affiliation. The tide turned in 2009 when a BBC documentary's archaeological revelations unveiled the remains of Cleopatra's sister, Arsinoi. Researchers concluded their African lineage, suggesting Cleopatra's mother shared the same roots, opening doors to the possibility of mixed ancestry. The quest to define Cleopatra's ethnicity bridges cultures and eras, prompting diverse opinions and intriguing discussions. The truth may forever elude us, but the legacy of this iconic queen transcends borders, embracing a heritage as diverse as the lands she once ruled. Join the discourse. Share your thoughts in the comments below and unravel the mystery of Cleopatra's heritage. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos.
See you in the next video. Marco Polo, the epic tale of a traveler, beyond borders. If you were to embark on a journey into the depths of history, encountering the name Marco Polo would be inevitable. Italian explorer and traveler Marco Polo was one of the rare individuals who left an indelible mark on world history, living an extraordinary life filled with discoveries. His life is akin to an epic saga woven with courage, curiosity, and explorations. Born in 1269 in Venice, Marco Polo came into the world as a child of a merchant family before becoming synonymous with exploration. When his father, Niccolò, and uncle, Maffeo, embarked on a journey to the distant east for trade purposes, young Marco seized the opportunity to accompany them on this exploratory voyage. At the age of 17, they reached the presence of the Chinese emperor, Kublai Khan, marking a turning point in Marco Polo's life. Becoming a favorite of Kublai Khan in China, Marco stayed in the country for 17 years. During this time, he explored the country, deeply immersed himself in its culture, and roamed within the inner circles of the dynasty. The magnificence and richness of China captivated him, and this experience served as inspiration for his later work, The Travels of Marco Polo. Marco Polo's work, The Travels of Marco Polo, stands as one of the most significant sources introducing the mysterious world of the East to the West. While recounting Polo's observations of China and its riches, the book also captures attention with its embellished tales of fantasy. Polo's narratives fueled the European fascination with the East and played a pivotal role in accelerating the age of exploration Marco Polo's journeys extended not only to China, but also deep into Central Asia and as far as India. His travels, bearing traces of the richness in India, the significance of salt trade, and interactions between different cultures, serve as an important example demonstrating how geography and cultures intertwined. Polo's travels weren't limited to geographical discoveries. They were a milestone in understanding how trade routes, cultures, and societies converged. They expanded Europe's limited worldview of the Middle Ages and sparked the desire to explore unknown lands. Today, Marco Polo's legacy lives on. His passion for travel, desire for exploration, and interactions with diverse cultures represent humanity's desire to expand its horizons. His story stands as a symbol of how courage and curiosity can shape humanity. The life of Marco Polo is a tale of an explorative spirit that redraws the world map. His name has left an eternal mark, not only on maps, but also in the minds of people to be remembered for eternity. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. Unveiling the Myth Did JFK really smoke weed in the Oval Office? The Kennedy legacy is one entwined with both public reverence and private indiscretions. John F. Kennedy, the iconic president, has been enveloped in whispers of clandestine behavior. 
But perhaps one of the most intriguing rumors revolves around his alleged foray into marijuana consumption within the hallowed halls of the White House. The tale weaves through various accounts, notably resurfacing in a National Enquirer article from 1976, linking Kennedy's supposed marijuana use to an affair with artist Mary Pinchot Meyer. Yet despite the proliferation of this narrative through the decades, substantiated evidence remains as elusive as a smoke ring in the wind. Fact checkers like PolitiFact and Snopes have diligently combed through the rumors, emerging empty-handed in the quest for concrete proof. Representatives from the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library further muddled the waters by asserting that his medical records contained no mention of marijuana. There's a particular twist to this tale that intertwines with Kennedy's health struggles. Plagued by Addison's disease, chronic back issues, prostatitis, and other ailments, the president sought solace in an array of medications. However, contrary to popular memes and claims, marijuana didn't find a place among his prescribed remedies. The most vivid account of Kennedy's supposed tryst with cannabis paints a recreational picture rather than a medicinal one. Allegedly, in a clandestine White House encounter in 1962, Mary Pinchot Meyer provided the president with marijuana. The scene, as described, involved the pair sharing three joints before JFK, ever the statesman, quipped about maintaining sobriety in case the Russians made a move. Remarkably, while Kennedy's personal cannabis exploits remain unconfirmed, his administration played a role in reshaping U.S. drug policy. As the 60s embraced a culture of drug use, reports commissioned by Kennedy and his successor, Lyndon B. Johnson, veered towards a lenient stance on marijuana. Contrary to draconian mandatory sentences, these reports found no evidence linking marijuana to increased violence or wider drug use. This shift culminated in the repeal of mandatory sentences in 1970, signaling a departure from strict prohibition. The murkiness surrounding Kennedy's alleged marijuana use blends the tantalizing allure of scandal with the nuances of evolving drug policy. Whether a mere urban legend or a clandestine truth buried in history, the story of JFK and marijuana remains shrouded in mystery an enigmatic footnote in the larger narrative of presidential legacies. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. The Enigma of Power, A Life Re-Examined, Henry Kissinger's Duality on the Global Stage. He walked the tightrope of peace and chaos, a weaver of destinies who left the world both awed and appalled. Henry Kissinger, the man who straddled the chasm between brilliance and brutality, has finally left the stage. His name, etched in the annals of history, remains a contentious tapestry of achievements and transgressions. Deciphering his legacy will be a dance on the razor's edge, a quest to understand the enigma of power he embodied. Kissinger's youth, ting with the bitter hoos of Wartem Germany, molded him into a pragmatist. Realpolitik became his gospel, a cold calculus where morality often bowed to the imperatives of national security. This philosophy propelled him from Harvard classrooms to the Oval Office, advising presidents from Kennedy to Nixon. He orchestrated diplomatic waltzes with China and Russia, while simultaneously prolonging the agony of Vietnam. 
In his eyes, the ends justified the means, a credo that earned him both the Nobel Peace Prize and the epithet War Criminal. His legacy is a Janus-faced monument. In one hand, he held the olive branch, brokering fragile peace deals in the Middle East. In the other, he wielded the sword, authorizing secret bombings and covert operations with ruthless efficiency. He was a hawk who advocated restraint, a statesman who dealt in shadows. This inherent duality, this dance with the devil for the sake of a perceived greater good, is the crux of the Kissingerian conundrum. His critics painted him as a Machiavellian puppet master, pulling the strings of global chaos. They pointed to his involvement in Chile's brutal dictatorship, his unwavering support for authoritarian regimes, and his relentless pursuit of American hegemony. To them, he was a stain on the conscience of a nation, a reminder of the moral price of pragmatism. Yet, his defenders argued that he navigated a perilous world with unmatched cunning. They lauded his real politique brilliance, his ability to navigate Cold War tensions and avert nuclear Armageddon. In their eyes, he was a necessary evil, a Kissingerian Mephistopheles, who secured peace through calculated ruthlessness. Now, in the quiet wake of his passing, we are left to grapple with the ghost of Henry Kissinger. Was he a visionary strategist or a morally bankrupt opportunist? A savior or a villain? Perhaps the answer lies not in absolutes, but in the complex tapestry of his life, woven with threads of both light and darkness. His legacy will continue to spark debate, his actions dissected and reinterpreted through the lens of history. But one thing remains certain. Henry Kissinger was a force of nature, a man who shaped the world in his own image, leaving behind a legacy as enigmatic as it is undeniable. He was a living paradox, a testament to the enduring human struggle between idealism and pragmatism, between the pursuit of peace and the preservation of power. As we move forward, let us remember Kissinger, not for the simplistic labels we try to pin on him, but for the complexities he embodied. Let his life serve as a reminder that history is rarely black and white, that the pursuit of power is a messy affair, and that the true measure of a man lies not in his victories, but in the choices he made along the way. This revised version aims to delve deeper into the complexities of Kissinger's legacy, avoiding one-sided labeling and instead presenting a nuanced perspective that acknowledges both his achievements and failures. It also emphasizes the lasting impact of his life and actions on the global stage, inviting readers to grapple with the ongoing debate surrounding his legacy. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. Kim Jong-un's Ascent a tale of destiny, power, and secrets. In the twilight of 2011, North Korea stood on the precipice of change. The nation mourned the passing of its leader, Kim Jong-il, ushering in the enigmatic rise of his successor, Kim Jong-un. Stepping into power at a reported 27 years old, the younger Kim's grip on authority remained a mystery, shrouded in a country veiled from the world. The narrative surrounding Kim Jong-un hinted at a potential shift toward openness, or perhaps a turbulent collapse due to his lack of political experience. Yet, neither materialized. North Korea remained an enigma to outsiders, its people restricted from leaving, while the regime amplified its nuclear program, projecting an unyielding facade. But how did Kim Jong-un navigate this labyrinth of power? Within North Korea's secretive dynamics, even discerning the leader's birth year remains a puzzle. 
let's unravel his ascent and the maneuvers sustaining his rule for over a decade. legendary lineage, myth, power, and propaganda. Kim Jong-un's narrative didn't begin with his birth, but traces back to a mythical family lineage. Steeped in legend, North Korean lore associates the Kim dynasty with Mount Pektu, attributing divine significance to their bloodline. From Kim Il-sung's guerrilla feats against the Japanese, to Kim Jong-il's supposed miraculous birth, the dynasty cultivated an aura of heroic ancestry, rooted in symbolism rather than historical accuracy. Sons and Succession, the tumultuous path to power. In a patriarchal society, the path to succession isn't solely determined by birthright. Kim Jong-un's older brothers, deemed unfit for different reasons, failed to inherit the mantle. assertive demeanor, emerged as the chosen heir, potentially earmarked for leadership from a tender age. The Enigmatic Rise From Obscurity to Leadership Kim Jong-un's public appearances were scarce before his father's demise, akin to his father's gradual ascent to power. However, subtle political maneuvers hinted at Kim Jong-un's impending leadership. Accumulating prestigious titles, despite a lack of evident political or military expertise, his swift rise culminated in assuming the country's reins at an unusually young age, posing a challenge to his legitimacy. A Glimpse Beyond Borders, Education Abroad While North Korea molded his upbringing, Kim Jong-un's four-year stint in Switzerland revealed glimpses of a different world. Concealing his identity, he navigated a life of privilege but faced adversity due to his mother's illness and the subsequent family defection. His European education and struggles with language underscore a nuanced background amidst the cloistered North Korean narrative. The perils of youthful leadership, challenges and controversies. Assuming leadership at a youthful 27, Kim Jong-un faced skepticism and the weight of legacy. Relying on familial political acumen, he navigated a delicate balance, leveraging the guidance of influential figures within the regime. Yet the shadows of executions and purges, including those of family members and high-ranking officials, cast a chilling shadow over his consolidation of power. The nuclear gambit, ambition and deterrence. Kim Jong. Un's leadership magnified North Korea's nuclear ambitions, elevating global concerns. While rooted in his predecessor's visions, Kim's tenure witnessed unprecedented advancements with a bold showcase of nuclear capabilities. His saber-rattling rhetoric and strategic posturing cemented North Korea's nuclear program as a defining element of his reign. Echoes of the past emulating ancestral aura. Drawing on his grandfather's revered persona, Kim Jong-un's image reflected a deliberate homage, emulating attire and hairstyles reminiscent of the revered Kim Il-sung. The present leader aimed to evoke nostalgia and authority. Whether a gesture of respect or a calculated projection of power, his aesthetic mirrored a bygone era. Modernization, facade, balancing progress and control. Kim Jong-un's rhetoric hinted at economic progress and modernization, yet substantial shifts remained elusive. Western amenities selectively introduced in Pyongyang contrast starkly with widespread economic hardships. Social media showcases of affluence obscure the stark reality for most citizens, underscoring the regime's tailored portrayal of progress. The enigma persists. Future prospects. 
amid uncertainty. As North Korea grapples with economic challenges and international sanctions, Kim Jong-un's leadership continues to foster intrigue. His modernization narrative grapples with the regime's steadfast control, leaving the future shrouded in uncertainty as the young leader navigates the delicate balance between progress and power consolidation. The enigmatic saga of Kim Jong-un's ascent illustrates a complex interplay of myth, power, and modernity, shaping the trajectory of a nation perpetually veiled from the world's gaze. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. A symbol of ancient trade and cultural exchange, the Silk Road stands as an emblematic connection between civilizations across continents. Imagine this ancient highway, where silk from China embarked on a journey, weaving through landscapes, exchanging hands for European wool, silver, and gold. This exchange was more than commerce. It was a conduit for the transmission of knowledge, technology, faith, and artistic expressions. Along its course, bustling hubs like Samarkand in modern-day Uzbekistan emerged transforming into cradles of intellectual discourse and innovation. The Silk Road's origins trace back to Xi'an, China, tracing its path alongside the formidable Great Wall, venturing through the challenging terrain of the Pamir Mountains into Afghanistan, and onward toward the Levant. From there, goods embarked on sea voyages, destined for the ports of the Mediterranean. Traveling the full 4,000-mile stretch was a rarity. Most traders specialized in sections of this sprawling route. As history unfolded, the decline of the Roman Empire in the 4th century CE cast a shadow over the Silk Road, rendering it perilous and dormant. It lay forgotten until the 13th century, when the Mongols breathed new life into its veins. Enter Marco Polo, an Italian explorer who traversed this ancient path, marking one of the initial encounters between Europe and China. Yet, beyond trade and cross-cultural bridges, mysteries linger along this historic route. Some scientists speculate that the merchants who traversed these roads inadvertently carried the plague bacteria, believed to have triggered the devastating Black Death. The Silk Road, a legacy spanning centuries, isn't just a tale of commerce. It's a narrative of interconnectedness knowledge exchange, and unforeseen consequences that echo through time. Its story continues to unfold, revealing the intricate ties that once bound distant lands and civilizations. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos, because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us, and helps us grow the channel, and produce more videos. See you in the next video. Dive into the captivating world of ancient beauty customs that adorned the elite across empires. In ancient Egypt, eye makeup was the pinnacle of allure, with both men and women adorning their eyes with coal, extending dark lines from the corners to accentuate facial contours. Journeying to Rome, red hair was the epitome of beauty until Julius Caesar introduced Gaelic slaves, Roman women, 
enchanted by their blonde locks, donned wigs crafted from Gallic hair, sparking a trend that enviously echoed across the city. Persian allure intertwined with the artistry of henna. Beyond hair dying, Persian women embraced henna for intricate hand and foot tattoos, a tradition still cherished in the Middle East, preserving an ancient legacy of beauty. The Mongol women, in their quest for opulence, adorned their hair braids with sumptuous velvet fabrics and coral ornaments, adding a touch of lavishness. But that wasn't all their extravagant headdresses laden with opulent embellishments, were marvels of balance and grandeur, defying gravity. Witnessing these ancient beauty rituals unveils an era where expressions of allure defined cultures. From the meticulous eye embellishments of Egypt to the opulent headdresses of the Mongols, these customs echo through time, leaving a legacy that transcends beauty alone. Explore the opulence. Share your thoughts in the comments below and dive into the captivating world of ancient beauty customs. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. The Central Intelligence Agency, commonly known as the CIA, is one of the world's most significant intelligence services. It is a globally recognized yet equally enigmatic institution situated at the center of many legends. It is known that the CIA has engaged in interesting operations worldwide and is one of the most successful entities in international intelligence warfare. However, as expected, the number of known facts about the CIA is far fewer than the unknown. One such intriguing element in CIA history is a sculpture named Kryptos. Crafted in 1990 by American artist Jim Sanborn and placed at the CIA headquarters in Virginia Langley, the sculpture initially appears rather ordinary. Made of copper and resembling a horizontal letter S, it features randomly placed letters. However, the truth is far more intriguing because this sculpture named Kryptos harbors some highly mysterious ciphers. What's more, even CIA employees have been unable to decode its secret. Let's delve into the details. The sculptor, Jim Sanborn, born on November 14, 1945, received education in art and sociology from leading institutions in the United States, particularly renowned for his sculptures displayed in numerous museums over the years. Sanborn became one of America's prominent artists. However, the work that would etch his name into history wasn't particularly striking from an aesthetic standpoint. Nevertheless, it held a significant mystery within. In 1990, Jim Sanborn created a sculpture to be displayed at the CIA headquarters, named Kryptos, meaning hidden in Greek. The sculpture was installed on November 3, 1990, at the CIA headquarters in Virginia, Langley, the sculpture, made of copper, stands 3.6 meters tall. At first glance, it might seem like an ordinary piece of art to many. However, the letters on the sculpture aren't arranged randomly. They represent a coded message. The letters on the sculpture are arranged randomly, but not incoherently. On the contrary, they signify a coded message. The ciphers on the crypto sculpture comprise a total of 872 characters, including 869 letters, two numbers, and one symbol. The ciphers in the first three sections of the sculpture were deciphered by David Stein, a CIA employee, in 1999. However, the fourth section of the sculpture, 
contains an unresolved, mysterious cipher. The ciphers in the first three sections of the crypto sculpture are highly intricate. Various methods have been employed to decode them, and cryptography experts and mathematicians have conducted several studies. However, a successful solution to the cipher in the fourth section has not yet been reached. Jim Sanborn provided some clues for those attempting to decipher the cipher in the fourth section of the sculpture. The clues given by the sculpture itself have directed various analyses and speculations, yet they haven't led to the decryption of the cipher. The fourth section of the crypto sculpture remains an unsolved secret at the CIA headquarters. Though some efforts to solve the cipher in the fourth section have yielded partial success, a complete solution hasn't been achieved yet. The crypto sculpture continues to pose a challenge for many mathematicians, cryptanalysts, and enthusiasts of mystery. Sanborn has promised a special reward to the person who manages to decipher the cipher in the fourth section of the sculpture. The decryption of the fourth section of the crypto sculpture has been an enduring puzzle for many years. The sculpture represents the mystery and secrets of the CIA and, simultaneously, questions the limits of human intellect. Many individuals interested in cryptography and cipher solving continue their efforts to decode the fourth section of the sculpture. The crypto sculpture opens a window to the mysterious world of the CIA and its secrets encoded within ciphers. By merging art and mystery, the sculpture offers visitors the opportunity to ponder and conduct research. Perhaps one day, the cipher in the fourth section of the sculpture will be solved, opening a new chapter in CIA history. However, for now, the crypto sculpture stands at the CIA headquarters as a mysterious and intriguing piece, safeguarding its secret. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. The Lioness of Jansi Lakshmi Bai, the warrior queen, who never surrendered. Few stories in history capture the spirit of courage and defiance, quite like that of Rani Lakshmi Bai, the Queen of Jhansi. From a young age, she defied stereotypes, mastering the art of swordsmanship and horse riding skills typically reserved for men. Married at a young age, she ruled alongside her husband for a decade, their reign marked by progress and prosperity. Yet fate dealt them a cruel hand, as they remained childless. Undeterred, they adopted a young boy, ensuring the future of their kingdom. However, tragedy struck again with the passing of the king, the British, ever opportunistic, refused to recognize the adopted heir, choosing instead to annex Jansi. This blatant act of injustice ignited a fire within Rani Lakshmi Bai. With a steely gaze and a heart filled with unwavering resolve, she declared, I shall not surrender my Jansi. Joining the Indian Rebellion of 1857, Rani Lakshmi Bai emerged as a beacon of resistance, leading her troops with unmatched courage and skill she became a symbol of defiance against colonial rule. When the British bombarded the Jhansi fort, she did the unthinkable. She fought through the enemy lines, her young son strapped securely to her back. Escaping the siege, she joined forces with other rebels, their ranks swelling with those inspired by her bravery. In the final battle, Rani Lakshmi Bai fell fighting for her homeland. Even the British commander, Hugh Rose, was forced to acknowledge her extraordinary valor, stating, the Indian mutiny had produced but one man, and that man was a woman.
Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. Roman Emperors, the Mad, the Bad, and the Bizarre. In the world of ancient Rome, emperors were not just rulers. They were also celebrities, gods, and sometimes even monsters. Were they simply mentally ill, or was there something more to their behavior? In this video, we'll take a look at some of the most bizarre and outrageous emperors in Roman history. We'll explore the lives of these emperors in more detail. We'll learn about their outrageous behavior, their shocking decisions, and their lasting impact on history. First up is Caligula, the Mad Emperor. Caligula was known for his wild and unpredictable behavior. He once declared war on the sea god Neptune, and he even had his troops stab the ocean with their swords. He also built a floating bridge across the Bay of Naples just for his horse. Caligula was also known for his cruelty and depravity. He would often torture and kill his enemies, and he even forced his own sister to marry him. He was eventually assassinated by his own guards. Next is Nero, the Tyrant Emperor. Nero was a cruel and sadistic ruler. He killed his own mother, and he even burned down Rome. He also married a male slave who looked like his dead wife. Nero was also a talented musician and artist. He often performed in public, and he even starred in his own plays. He was eventually forced to commit suicide by the Roman Senate. And finally, we have Elagabalus, the trans emperor. Elagabalus was the first transgender emperor in history. He preferred to be addressed as Domina, meaning my lady. He also dressed in women's clothing and frequented brothels. Elagabalus was a controversial figure. Some people saw him as a visionary leader, while others saw him as a degenerate. He was eventually assassinated by his own guards. These are just a few of the many bizarre emperors who ruled Rome. Their stories are shocking, but they also offer a glimpse into the fascinating and often dark world of ancient Rome. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. Unintentional Missteps how Princess Diana challenged royal Christmas traditions. Christmas in the British royal family unveils an intricate tapestry of tradition and protocol, a realm where even the seemingly innocent exchange of gifts weaves its own set of rules. For Princess Diana, stepping into this ceremonial world post-marriage to Prince Charles was a journey filled with unintended breaches of customary practices. stirring whispers within the regal corridors. In 1981, Diana, with her characteristic grace, offered her sister-in-law, Princess Anne, a lavish cashmere sweater as a heartfelt Christmas gesture. Little did she know the royals had a penchant for whimsical, jestful gifts. Instead of reciprocating with a customary token, Diana found herself the recipient of an unexpected yet quirkily humorous toilet roll holder. It was a subtle initiation into the royal's unorthodox yuletide traditions, a world where the mundane transformed into the extraordinary. 
The following year saw Princess Diana's valiant attempt to assimilate into this unique gifting culture. In a light-hearted retaliation, she presented Sarah, Duchess of York, with a whimsical leopard print bath mat, joining the merry tradition that had long eluded her understanding. However, amidst the festive glitz and seemingly jovial exchanges, Diana's Christmas experiences also mirrored her tumultuous journey within the royal family. An incident from 1985 echoes the strains within her marriage to Prince Charles. Diana, harboring a passion for ballet from her earlier years, clandestinely indulged in dance lessons to surprise her husband during a Christmas gala. Her flawless performance met with unexpected ire, with Charles perturbed by her unplanned spotlight moment, hinting at deeper underlying tensions. The poignant final Christmas Diana spent among the Windsors in 1991 offers a poignant snapshot of her struggles. Cloaked in the veneer of royal etiquette, she grappled with personal turmoil while upholding the facade of marital harmony, a facade that was crumbling behind the scenes. As depicted in recent dramatizations, this period sheds light on the intricate web of expectations and the delicate balance between tradition and personal strife. Princess Diana's inadvertent missteps during these Christmases reflect not only the clash between her genuine warmth and the royal's unconventional customs, but also the deeper complexities of her journey within the royal family. Her story serves as a reminder that even within the grandeur of tradition, the human experience persists, marked by challenges and unexpected turns. As the holiday season approaches, it's a poignant reminder that behind the glittering facade of royal ceremonies lie stories of human struggle, resilience, and the perennial quest for acceptance and belonging. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. Genghis Khan From nomadic warrior to emperor of empires Genghis Khan's legacy is indeed one of unparalleled military might and empire building. His rise from a humble background to a ruler of an extensive empire is a testament to his strategic genius and military leadership. Temujin's early years marked the beginning of his ascent displaying remarkable tactical skills and resilience. His ability to unite the Mongol tribes under his leadership laid the groundwork for what would become one of the most expansive and influential empires in history. The Mongol Empire's territorial expanse across Asia and Europe was unparalleled, covering vast swathes of land and diverse cultures. Khan's military strategies Notably, his effective use of cavalry and innovative tactics were instrumental in his conquests. He adeptly utilized psychological warfare, such as strategic withdrawals and psychological intimidation, to gain advantages on the battlefield. His capacity to merge conquered peoples into his empire, fostering loyalty and inclusivity, was a remarkable feat that contributed to the empire's longevity. While his legacy is often associated with brutality due to the devastation that accompanied some of his conquests, Genghis Khan's vision and leadership qualities were also instrumental in shaping the administrative, economic, and cultural landscape of the regions he conquered. Ultimately, Genghis Khan's enduring influence on military strategy, empire building, and the cultural landscape of Eurasia remains an integral part of his historical legacy. His military achievements and the vastness of his empire solidify his place among history's most significant and influential military leaders.
Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. Unveiling Mysteries Secrets Beneath the Pyramids Erected as timeless monuments across Egypt's sprawling landscapes, pyramids stand as silent witnesses to an ancient era. Despite centuries of scrutiny, these enigmatic structures continue to harbor secrets, and recent revelations suggest there might be more beneath their imposing exteriors. With an estimated count of around 138 pyramids peppering Egypt's terrain, these structures vary widely in size and purpose. Dating back to 2600 BC, King Djoser's Pyramid, standing at 200 feet, is among the earliest known. From the relatively diminutive buried pyramid of Sekhemket Djoserti to the towering red pyramid of Sneferu, each pyramid carries its own story woven into the tapestry of Egypt's history. Among these, the Great Pyramid of Giza, a testament to human ingenuity, once reigned as the world's tallest structure, soaring nearly 500 feet into the sky. Housing the remains of Pharaoh Khufu, this awe-inspiring complex continues to captivate millions of visitors annually, drawing curiosity not just upward, but downward beneath its ancient foundation. Speculations about hidden chambers and passageways beneath the Giza pyramids date back centuries, with references from British Consul General Henry Salt's journals in the early 19th century. Recent breakthroughs, leveraging advanced particle physics, revealed a mysterious void inside the Great Pyramid, mirroring the Grand Gallery's size and shape. This groundbreaking discovery, achieved through muon radiography as part of the Scan Pyramids project, stunned experts, opening unforeseen possibilities. However, mysteries persist. Questions loom regarding the void's orientation, structure, and purpose, baffling even the most seasoned Egyptologists. Concurrently, tales of catacombs and subterranean networks continue to echo through time. British and Italian explorers in the 1800s claimed the discovery of vast catacombs beneath the Great Pyramid, only to lose the entrance amidst treacherous terrain filled with venomous creatures. Enter explorer Andrew Collins, on the brink of potentially unlocking these ancient riddles. His pursuit to locate Salt's long-lost entrance near the Great Pyramid's tomb teems with promise. Collins postulates an expansive network of caves and passages sprawling beneath the Giza Plateau, aligning with ancient texts hinting at a subterranean world surrounding the pyramids. The very name, Giza, translating to Mouth of the Passages, in ancient Egyptian, evokes the possibility of an enigmatic underground labyrinth a fabled domain poised to rewrite our understanding of ancient civilizations. As the sands of time slowly unveil their secrets, the allure of Egypt's pyramids transcends the visible, beckoning explorers to delve deeper beyond the surface into a realm teeming with untold wonders. Join us as we embark on a journey to uncover the mysteries lurking beneath the timeless edifices as ancient secrets unveil themselves from the depths of history. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. 
MH370, the vanished plane and the mystery behind its final words. The intrigue surrounding Malaysia flight. MH370's mysterious disappearance continues to captivate minds, its final moments shrouded in enigma. Despite scattered debris being discovered, the bulk of the plane remains elusive, leaving the cause of the crash a haunting enigma. The unsettling normalcy of the final transmission from the cockpit adds to the puzzling nature of this tragedy. Initially reported as, all right, good night, by Malaysian officials, the accuracy of these last words became a subject of contention. Subsequent revelations altered this narrative, suggesting the last communication was, good night, Malaysian 370, seemingly routine and devoid of any alarming cues. The flight's erratic trajectory, sudden unexplained turns captured on radar, prompted suspicions of foul play. Authorities raised the haunting specter of extremism or deliberate suicidal intent, attributing the plane's actions to potential criminal acts or terrorism. Yet, these theories remained unverified, amplifying the uncertainty veiling MH370's fate. Amidst the confusion, discovered debris, including cabin panel fragments and wing components, provided glimpses into the tragedy's aftermath. These pieces, linked to the Boeing 777, surfaced off African coasts and Indian Ocean islands. However, these findings offered scant solace, failing to elucidate the circumstances of the flight's demise. The inexplicable course alterations following the last transmission veering towards Malaysia and then diverting to the Indian Ocean, heightened the puzzle. Absent distress signals or adverse weather reports, the plane's inexplicable maneuvers perpetuated the mystery, spawning unfounded conjectures ranging from extraterrestrial intervention to elaborate cover-up conspiracies. MH370's haunting legacy endures, a saga of unanswered questions, spurring speculation, but yielding few definitive answers. Its perplexing final moments echo a somber reminder of the lingering void surrounding this aviation tragedy, leaving a haunting imprint on the annals of unsolved mysteries. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos, because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us, and helps us grow the channel, and produce more videos. See you in the next video. Founding Fathers Divergent Views on the Boston Tea Party Property Rights Clash the views among America's founding fathers regarding the Boston Tea Party were not uniform. While the event symbolized resistance against British oppression, interpretations varied significantly among prominent figures, particularly George Washington and Benjamin Franklin. Massachusetts stood as the hotbed of revolt, yet not all colonies shared identical sentiments. George Washington, in private correspondences, exhibited a nuanced stance. He condemned the destruction of the tea, marking it as an assault on private property, a sentiment echoed by Benjamin Franklin. Both figures believed in the sanctity of private property rights, a core principle aligned with personal liberty. Washington's initial response, as suggested by historical claims, depicted a stronger disapproval of the Bostonians' actions, branding them as mad for their attack on private property. This more critical viewpoint might have softened over time, as his subsequent letters showed a broader alignment with the cause of America while still maintaining a disapproval of the specific act of destroying the tea. Franklin, initially seen as moderate, advocated for non-violent resolutions and urged reparations for the damaged tea.
However, his position shifted notably after a humiliating experience before the British Privy Council, propelling him toward a more assertive role in supporting the move toward independence. The discord among the founders regarding the Boston Tea Party was rooted in their staunch belief in the significance of private property. Despite their grievances with Britain, the destruction of the East India Company's tea presented a clash with their ideals. The event, which incurred substantial material costs, highlighted the founders' dedication to property rights as an essential pillar of personal freedom. Their condemnation of the Tea Party stemmed from this principled stance on property rights. Nevertheless, their broader alignment with the cause of America in the face of British oppression marked a crucial unity among the founders, even amidst differing views on specific actions taken in protest. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video. Nostradamus 2024 Prophecies Chilling Predictions For 2024 Some of the greatest poets of all time, such as Walt Whitman and William Blake, are described as visionaries for the images they are able to convey and imprint on the reader's memory. But few poets are said to predict the future in the visions they share. Except for Nostradamus, whose predictions remain of great curiosity to modern people, nearly five centuries after the poet and oracle's death in 1566. During his lifetime, Nostradamus was known as a plague doctor and an astronomer in his native France. But his name is famous around the world thanks to the publication of 1555's Les Prophecies, a vast collection of hundreds of four-line verses or quatrains, also known as his centuries, that he claimed offered deep insights into the events that would affect humanity up until the year 3797. Nostradamus's prophecies are incredibly cryptic, and skeptics argue it's easy to interpret his predictions as if he correctly foresaw certain events. Indeed, when it comes to his predictions for 2024, it doesn't take too much effort to match his words up to what's already happening on the world stage and to conclude what he thought might happen. Here are four of the 2024 predictions analysts have pulled from his writings. Climate change will start to bite. Nostradamus's visions of the future are biblical in their imagery, particularly when it comes to images of the end of the world. And such images, fantastical as they often are, have grown more believable in recent years with the advent of climate change. As noted by several analysts, Nostradamus' earlier quatrains certainly lay the groundwork for a world facing the catastrophic effects of global warming and 2024 seems to be no different. Several interpreters of Nostradamus' centuries point to a quatrain describing boiling seas, rivers, and lakes alongside the prediction of a great drought. They suggest this is evidence that the oracle predicted climate change leading to a greater portion of the earth becoming unlivable for humans and animals. Indeed, scientific consensus claims that rising sea temperatures are harming marine life, meaning that Nostradamus' prediction isn't as off the wall as it might first appear. Meanwhile, scientific forecasters such as Smart Rain do indeed predict a drought for 2024, particularly in the northwestern United States. A War-Torn Age since the COVID-19 pandemic, global news cycles have been dominated by the outbreak of war. In February 2022, 
Russia invaded Ukraine, pushing tensions between the superpower and the West to their highest point since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Though Russia seemingly expected their neighbor to fold in a matter of days, with Western backing Ukraine has exhibited remarkable resistance, and the conflict looks unlikely to be resolved anytime soon. In the fall of 2023, Israel declared war on Hamas, following a brutal attack on Israeli civilians, leading to intense bombing of the Gaza Strip and thousands of further deaths. Analysts of Nostranamus's centuries claim that his quatrains predict further conflict for 2024, with the poet specifically envisaging that a huge naval battle will take place. In Nostradamus, the complete prophecies for the future, Mario Reading highlights a quatrain describing a calamitous war that he believes is brought about by two great allied powers. Some, including the Jerusalem Post, have claimed that the quatrains point to a confrontation between China and NATO, which, taken in light of Reading's analysis, would suggest the dawn of a new Chinese-Russian pact. King Charles III's reign will be cut short. The British monarchy lost its long-reigning matriarch, Queen Elizabeth II, in 2022 at the age of 96. The timing of which the Jerusalem Post claims Nostradamus correctly predicted. While Charles III became the new king at the moment of her death, Royal Watchers had to wait until May 2023 for his coronation, an opulent affair full of pomp and ceremony, as the UK celebrated its new monarch and wished him a long reign. However, despite going through one of the most turbulent periods in living memory, the British royals should expect even more upheaval in 2024, at least according to Nostradamus. Per Mario Redding's Nostradamus, after the lines predicting a calamitous war, the Quatrain envisions. Soon afterwards a new king shall be anointed, who for a long time will appease the earth. Some have interpreted this as meaning that Charles will choose to abdicate and make way for a monarch who might enjoy greater longevity, though another Quatrain foresees a king being forced from the throne. Though his son, Prince William, is next in line, some analysts have pointed to the claim that one with no mark of a king shall take the throne and suggested it means Prince Harry will assume power. A new Pope will wreak havoc. And it's not just the British royal family that is believed to see a momentous change of guard in 2024. According to some sources, the Catholic Church is also going to see a new figurehead emerge. Pope Francis Thay will turn 88 in December 2024, which makes the prediction appear especially prescient. Arguably, the Pope has served his time. He ascended to the Vatican's highest office in 2013 after the resignation of his predecessor. And it would certainly make sense for him to retire while still able to fulfill his duties as pontiff. The lines highlighted by the Irish examiner, however, foretell the Pope's death and his replacement by a young Roman. Though arguably, Roman, in this case, refers to the church itself, with the youthful replacement predicted to unleash acute damage on the pontificate. But Catholics need not panic unjustly. The fact is that though Nostradamus is famous for the hundreds of uncanny predictions, they aren't all interpreted the same way, nor assigned to the same time period by analysts. The quatrain highlighted by the Irish Examiner, for example, turns up in Mario Reading's Nostradamus II, only this time it is said to relate to 2056. Even in prophecy it appears nothing is set in stone. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel like the video, and share it so you can stay updated with more great content. Also, be sure to check out our other videos because you'll find many interesting topics there as well. Your support means a lot to us and helps us grow the channel and produce more videos. See you in the next video.